Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Corey D.B. Walker. I'm the dean of the Wake Forest University School of Divinity and the Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities. And I want to thank you for joining us for this year's McBrien Prophetic Preaching Series. Betty Collier Thomas's groundbreaking text, Daughters of Thunder, Black Women Preachers and Their Sermons, 1850 through 1979, provides the name, frame, and context for today's historic gathering. And just as part of Betty Collier Thomas's text begins with the arrival of a suitcase on her doorstep by the granddaughter of Florence Randolph, a gift that marks only the second known collection of sermons by an African-American woman. This gathering is a gift. As a gift, it is what is unexpected, what is unaccounted for, what is unwarranted, and what is not expected. It punctures the textures of what of given reality. It ruptures our cognitive registers as it unfolds a new landscape of existence, a new horizon of possibility, and a new space for being human in the world. What does the Christian faith have to say that will give strength and hope to those who struggle against powers and principalities, the institutionalized evils and injustices which destroy the humanity of whole peoples and which are virtually immune to individual morality? Some writers convinced that the Christian church is too deeply implicated in supporting the status quo to be forced to be a force for liberation, have gone beyond Christianity and seek new religious symbols. Most, however, re have remained within the Christian tradition while developing new concepts and challenging the content of orthodox doctrines at crucial points. These bold and bracing words by the late Polly Murray, delivered in her April 1st, 1979 sermon, Salvation and Liberation, at the Unitarian Society of Germantown in Philadelphia, provide the context for this afternoon's lecture. Today, we stand in the long shadow of that grand tradition that Pauli Murray represents and the questions that she raises in her sermon, a sermon as elegant for its beauty and as bracing for its challenge. The centrality of the sermon is announced by Hortense Spillers in her 1974 Brandeis doctoral dissertation, Fabrics of History, Essays on the Black Sermon, when she writes, the black, pe the black preacher speaks the first poetry of America. Now the sermon has been subject to the demands of analysis relative to the literary and political imagination by a range of scholars and writers, including Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, and James Weldon Johnson. Each have revealed its protein character and certain aspects of analysis, the music of the preacher that truly requires technical expertise. And extending these modes of exploration and creating a hospitable space for the demands of not only a sermonic freedom, but also a spiritual freedom, a political freedom, and an economic freedom requires a fundamental conceptualization of reconceptualization of the categories of thought and this is uniquely announced within the poetic register 
of black women preachers. It requires for the hearer an attentiveness to the disciplines of imagination and all of its complexity, such that the sermon as poem strives towards an articulation that does not find its release until the preacher is liberated from the text or the rigid boundaries of argument by gesture, by shout, by gesticulation, or by the power of one's individual voice. Today marks a singular moment in the history of Wake Forest University School of Divinity and Wake Forest University. We have welcomed a stellar group of African-American women who are Wake Forest University School of Divinity alumni, faculty, professionals, and prominent and prophetic preachers who, who provide us with an exemplary exhibit of the spirituality, wisdom, intellect, power, and commitment collected in Betty Collier Thomas's text and extended in this tradition long into the future. The McBrien Prophetic Preacher Series, it was established in honor of the memory of George McLeod McBrien Sr class of 1941 and MA class of 1944 here at Wake Forest University by George and Carol Williamson, longtime supporters of Wake Forest and of Wake Forest, uh, Wake Forest School of Divinity and early advocates for the importance of the School of Divinity. McBrien was a professor of religion and taught at the university for 37 years after joining the Faculty of Religion in 1956. He introduced courses on feminism, religion and science, medical ethics, and black and liberation theology as a professor here. He fought tirelessly for civil rights, pursued social reform, and was instrumental in helping to integrate Wake Forest College in the 1960s. Brian wrote several books on social justice, including These Few Who Paid a Price and Voices in the Wilderness. This series brings preachers and speakers to the campus of Wake Forest University who will inspire our students to live and serve and embody our grand motto, Pro Humanitate, at the intersection of Christianity and social justice. I'm delighted to welcome my dear colleague and the convener for the 2023 McBrien Prophetic, uh, McBrien Prophetic Speaker Series, the Reverend Dr. Melva Sampson, Assistant Teaching Professor of Preaching and Practical Theology at the Wake Forest University School of Divinity. She will not only introduce our lecturer this year, she will engage in a conversation with our guest lecturer and open up for a brief conversation with all who are gathered here today in Wake Chapel. Professor Sampson is a practical theologian and ordained minister with a national reputation for her research on black preaching, on black preaching women's embodiment, African heritage spiritual traditions, black girls' ritual performance, and the relationship between digital proclamation and spiritual formation. She is the creator and curator of Pink Robe Chronicles and Raising Womanish Girls, both digital platforms used to elucidate the role of sacred memory and ritual in the collective healing of marginalized communities. Reverend Dr. Melba Sampson. Good evening. Thank you, 
Dean Walker and to all of the alum that are present, as well as to our Board of Visitors and to our broader community, it gives me great pleasure to stand before you to introduce not only a colleague in the work, but a comrade sister. Betty Collier Thompson um, tells us that with the exception of a few, that most black women who pursued ministry between 1800 and 1970 are virtually unknown. Hence her groundbreaking work on the Daughters of Thunder. This phrase, Daughters of Thunder, used by Lawrence H. Mamiya and C. Eric Lincoln in their book, The Black Church and the African American Experience, refers to African American women preachers. Thunder, thunder reflects power, authority, charisma, confidence that black preaching women often evoke in their sermons. I, however, theorize thunder as spiritual power visible in, again, this authority and this confidence. It is clear, or at least religious history tells us, that some black cisgender heterosexual male authority has made uh, little to no room for black women's preaching bodies. That the pulpit is a traditional site of knowledge production in the black church, and males are considered chief generators, but, Black women's ability to confront and critically engage hegemony does not solely rest in the pulpit. Enter Dr. Chelsea Brooke Yarbrough, who is at her core a preacher, a poet, a curator, a sister, a friend, an auntie, a daughter, and a professor. She is a coach, an Enneagram lover, a reader, a worshiper, and a ritualist. She curates opportunities for individuals and groups to encounter their most beloved self through consulting, coaching, and speaking. Chelsea wants people to walk through their lives experiencing and practicing the most love possible. She was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. She is a proud alumna of Elon University where she earned a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. And she also is a proud alumna of, I'm gonna put the V in front of it, the Wake Forest University School of Divinity. <laughs> And she earned, shall I say again, earned the PhD, earned the PhD from Vanderbilt University. She currently is the assistant professor of African American preaching, sacred rhetoric, and black practical theology at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Her research focuses on imagining within and beyond normative understanding of preaching and proclamation through the expansive practices of historical black women. Chelsea loves to create space for people to play, to wonder, and to step into the courageous waters of growth. It gives me profound honor on this afternoon to stand in the presence, to stand in the brilliance, to stand in the company, and to welcome back home you, Reverend Dr. Chelsea Brooke Yarbrough, whom after this selection is the next voice that you will hear. sing with me. Oh, praise him. Praise him. Oh, praise him. Praise him. Jesus, 
blessed Savior. Oh, he's worthy to be praised from the rising, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same. He is worthy. Jesus is worthy, he is worthy to be praised. Everybody praise him, praise him. Everybody praise him, praise him. Jesus, blessed Savior, nobody like him is worthy to be praised. From the rising, from the rising of the sun until the going down. Of the same, he is worthy, Jesus is worthy, he is worthy to be praised. Sing glory, glory, oh, glory. In all things, give him glory, Jesus, blessed Savior. There's nobody like him. He's worthy to be praised, Jesus, Jesus, blessed Savior. Nobody like him, he's worthy to be praised. Sing it one more time. Jesus, blessed Savior, he is worthy to be praised. Well, I certainly know a God that's worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Beloved, it is a gift and an honor to be home. Yes. We don't always get to go home in a good way. We don't always get to go home and be a new person. And so I'm glad to be here on the other side of a PhD. <laughs> I thank God for that for more ways than one. Um, and to be with all of you. And so to Dean Walker, thank you for the invitation. To Dr. Sampson, thank you for the invitation and for being a sister in this work. And to Catherine Morris for making sure I got here, that I was hydrated and that I had tissues. <laughs> it has been a full day. And to the panelists from earlier, if you were there earlier, you knew we have already had a dynamic day. And so let's continue, continue in that energy. The title for my talk today is Preaching Amidst Crisis, Fannie Lou Hamer and Her Threads of Thunder. Now I'd like to begin our time together by unpacking some terms that will set the foundation for this talk. Now if you know me, you know I love rhetoric, therefore I love a definition and find it important to articulate clearly what I mean as opposed to assuming we all agree on these terms. First, age of crisis. Age of points to a period of time. It is named as a descriptor before something to assert particularly of a given time. 
Crisis is defined formally as a time of intense difficulty, trouble, and or danger. It is synonymous with words like catastrophe and calamity. See, Oxford Dictionary points out that equally true is that it is defined as a time when an important decision must be made, a turning point. We are certainly in an age of crisis, a time of extreme violence and disregard for human dignity, dignity and where oppression and marginalization continue to expand, a catastrophe, a calamity, perhaps a turning point if we will turn. And yet, black women continue to preach. But as I wondered, I asked which age black women have had the luxury of preaching outside of crisis? Outside of the systemic assault on our being through the systemic harm of anti-blackness, anti-womanness, anti-queerness, anti-transness, anti-disabled, anti-fat, anti-poor, and the list unfortunately continues. My slight shift to amidst crisis is a reminder of who has the privilege to engage ages of crisis and who has the constant reality of being amidst. Amidst the crisis of systems that aim to kill our bodies, amidst ideologies that would try to teach us we are labor and not life, amidst institutions that fetishize illusions of magic in the gifts that we bring so they don't have to be accountable for the harm that they do, because if you are magic, you are not real. Amidst ecclesiological spaces that try to compartmentalize call and question our capabilities to preach in pulpits, why? Because of misogyny, cosplaying as theology, crafting a God so small that they could only fit into the confines of one humanly constructed gender identity. Crisis. Amidst and across the ages and periods of crisis, black women continue to preach but still why Daughters of Thunder? I was immediately reminded of the book that's been brought up today, Daughters of Thunder by Betty Collier Thomas. My late mentor, Dale P. Andrews, gave me this book when I started my doctoral work, and he told me that it was important for me to understand black women's preaching beyond the monolith it is normally presented as. So as I picked up the book, thinking about where I wanted to focus this lecture, a question hit me, why thunder? Now, science has never been my specialty, y'all. So I looked on YouTube, quote, teaching children about thunder <laughs> to get a clear understanding of what thunder is. I found out something perhaps is common knowledge, but I didn't know, so I'm gonna share it with y'all. See, thunder occurs as a response to lightning. Amidst crisis, the sound of thunder is a warning because if you can hear thunder, you are within the striking distance of lightning. Lightning is incredibly dangerous, and its impact is often minimized when you are in the house. Anxiety about its strike is often much lower when you have shelter. Thunder can simply be added to the ecosystem of sounds around you unless you're without coverage, needing to use its wisdom for your survival. Thunder doesn't aim to be cute. It isn't looking to be palatable. It sounds the alarm. Lightning is here. Take cover. In a world of so much lightning, so much danger, so much crisis. Thunder is a crucial response. Lightning is striking, supremacy is striking, oppression is striking, injustice is flourishing. What must we do to build shelter, spaces and places of refuge for those vulnerable to its hit? And so a response, one response has been sacred rhetoric, to preach, to thunder. And so certainly in this paradigm of crisis and through the profound response that is thunder, I like to posit a definition for preaching. Now most often preaching is defined first by pulpit and then by whatever else comes after that. <laughs> but here's the thing, thunder is not something that can be contained. And so one platform could not hold all that black women's preaching is and will continue to be. So might I offer another working definition? Effective preaching, is grounded in theological assertions that call out systems and call in the community through practices of love that always must look like justice. This definition has far less to do with the platform or the personality and far more to do with the practice. In this definition, there are plenty of occupants of pulpits who are speaking, but I might wonder, is preaching occurring?
More importantly, there are folks in bars and coffee shops, on the steps of City Hall and in classrooms, around kitchen tables and at the salon, at tarot tables and open mics and studio, on IG and on TikTok, in Reiki sections that preach without ever entering a pulpit. Practice supersedes platform. So in that vein, I want to focus the remainder of my time on someone who's preaching expanded platforms and who I consider to be one of my greatest teachers in the art of effective proclamation. Today, we'll turn our attention to Fannie Lou Hamer. Now, I cannot do her story justice fully in this time, and so know that I know that. But I have to give you a snapshot before I talk about the rhetorical strategies that she lifts that I believe can help us today. Fannie Lou Townsend was born October 6, 1917, in Mississippi to Jim and Ella Townsend, was one of 20 children. She was a brilliant and inquisitive child, winning several spelling bees and oratorical contests, but her education was cut short because she could not go to school, formal school, because we know you can get an education without going to school, but that's another lecture. She could not go to formal school past the age of, past the grade of sixth grade because she had to work to help her family survive. At one point, her family was able to gain some financial independence through cattle farming and owning a house on their land. But as we know, black flourishing is often met with white violence. A group of local white men from the community came and poisoned their cattle and sent them back into financial despair that they were never able to recover from. Hamer knew from a very young age the ramifications of white violence and as she later posited, quote, white cowardice that only shows up in the form of a mob, for as she said, I never have seen them come alone. Hamer talked often about the gift of her mother's love and faith as a critical piece of what fortified her against the evils for which she was proclaiming. Her mother consistently instilled in her the need to be proud and to love who she was, despite everything around her that would tell her that to be black was not beautiful and not something that she should be proud of. Her mother's consistent reminder of who she was and who she was in God's eyes carried her through many seasons and situations that she would have otherwise not gotten through per her own words. In her 20s, she married Pop Hamer and they later adopted two girls. And she named taking care of her girls changed something because she began to see the world through their potential harm and not just her own. Now, since I cannot move through Hamer's story fully as I'd like to, in the spirit of our theme amidst crisis, I find it critical to name a few particular situations that ignited her preaching ministry. First, in 1961, she was scheduled to have an ovarian cyst removed. Instead, she was given a hysterectomy without her consent, which was not uncommon for black women in those times, especially in the region of the Mississippi Delta. She describes her emotion as deep anger that wouldn't settle. And so since it wouldn't settle, the following year when civil rights workers from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee came to Ruleville, Mississippi and held a gathering to get black people to vote, she went. And that gathering was a turning point. She decided that it was time to fight voter suppression and that she would be an organizer in the community to create mutual aid. Second was her experience in Winona, Mississippi on June 9th, 1963. She and several other activists were arrested, brutally beaten, and held captive in a prison for the audacity to believe that black people should vote. Hamer was beaten so badly that she had permanent damage to her eyesight and kidneys and had to take extensive time to recover. She could have stopped and didn't. The last moment that I will highlight is April 26, 1964. Hamer and a few hundred other Mississippians went to the Democratic National Convention to form the Mississippi Free Democratic Party as a response to an all-white delegation that clearly did not represent the population that they were there to do so. Hamer was known at this point across Mississippi, but here at 47 is where she began to get national acclaim. On March 14, 1977, at the young age of 59, Hamer passed away. Amidst the constancy of crisis, Fannie Lou Hamer preached and utilized particular strategies embedded within her preaching life that made for profound preaching moments. 
While there's a wealth to learn from her experience, I'm going to lift like a good Baptist preacher three <laughs> threads of thunder from her rhetorical strategies. Too often black women are not given theoretical, uh, are not seen as sources for theoretical inquiry. We are described, we are seen as places to gaze upon, and so we're gonna change that today. For Fannie Lou Hamer had a rhetorical strategy, a Hamer homiletic. The first strategy I uplift from Hamer is aesthetic disruption. The term aesthetic is concerned with beauty or the appreciation of beauty, whereas disruption is something that interrupts an event, activity, or process. So aesthetic disruption then interrupts the process and or activity of that which has been considered beautiful and or palatable and or normative for the purposes of critical change. This term emerges from design methods. See, in design, whether it be tech and or spatial design, aesthetic disruption is used to spark a process of inquiry with the belief that inquiry destabilizes that which has been habitual, creating space for innovation. Aesthetic disruption is so effective because its presence questions the viability of whatever visual has been shifted. It asks who decides what's beautiful and or right and or faithful and or just. And more importantly, do those norms still serve us today or have they ever? Hamer's practice of aesthetic disruption disrupts definitions of what preaching is. She does not enter pulpits, yet is engaging scripture, articulating theological worldview, combining contextual realities, and is always very clear in her messaging. She disrupted normative considerations for sacred speech, creating her own platforms and entering those that her body was not seen as belonging in. Hamer disrupted space and also expanded the normative ideas about who gets to preach and hold space in the places that she went. What do I mean? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Hamer was not formally educated, nor did she aim to speak like anyone other than herself. She was black and woman and a larger woman. She had the dialect of someone from the Mississippi Delta and was, as I said, only formally educated through sixth grade. She was critiqued for the way she talked, how she looked, what she said, and how she said. Many said that she was too raw, and her response was, I'm honest. On her first national broadcast, her presence and her story was so uncomfortable that President Johnson called a press conference to interrupt something about lightning switches with the tech, you know, to interrupt her broadcast. But unfortunately for him, far too many people had already heard her story and it sparked a response. She didn't only make white America uncomfortable because she pushed against notions of a particular type of proclamation that was also preferred for some of her fellow black activists. She was asked by Dr. King to be more polished in her approach, to not ask for everything right away, and her response was, but we need it right now. Her embodiment spoke. Hainer's disruptive embodiment practice and rhetorical prowess made it hard for people to ignore even though they tried to. It destabilized supremacy even for a moment and highlighted the voice of someone who had otherwise been silenced. As a newspaper article said, there was always a response to what she said. Sometimes it was the cowardice of white violence, but other times someone heard her thunder and decided to join in the ranks as well. I believe Audre Lorde said it best, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. Mimicry of what always has been is asking recycled oil to be fresh, trying to create innovation from sameness and being surprised that we keep getting the same result with a new face, with a new lip color, but yet the same moving thing. Hammer's embodiment, place and voice antagonized the norm on purpose, such that the waters drowning those in her home in the Mississippi Delta had to be troubled so that they could shift. A second thread of thunder critical to Hamer's homiletic was storytelling a sacred text. She consistently wove the story of God and the biblical text and her personal narrative into the fabric of her preaching as both necessary for her singular message, justice in the form of systemic and communal change. See, Hamer's story of God was not that God was just anywhere. God for her was on the side of justice. 
Hamer's exegetical work wasn't necessarily done linearly at library tables, but as the child of a Baptist preacher and a lifelong person of faith, she had the word, as my grandmother used to say, hidden in her heart, such that she was able to pull from it. She studied not only in her devotional life, but the stories of the Bible were a part of her vernacular. And so in her sermon, We Are On Our Way, Hamer said, America is divided against, quote, America is divided against itself. And without their considering us human beings, one day America will crumble because God is not pleased. God is not pleased at all the murdering, at all the brutality and the killings for no reason at all. God is not pleased at the Negro children in the state of Mississippi suffering from malnutrition. She continued on to the ways that God is not pleased, and she continues articulates that God was not only pleased, but that God fights alongside those who fight against those ills. In another instance, she uses the same practice of weaving story to situate the text as a mirror to the Christian church. In this instance, specifically a group of black male preachers who refused to let SNCC and other organizations hold meetings in their churches for fear of repercussions. She says, quote, the preacher said, I don't like bringing politics into the church. And when he says that it makes me sick because he's telling a big lie, because every dollar bill got a politician on it. And the preacher loves that. She continued, you know, they like to rear back in the corners and over the rostrum and say, what God has done for me, Shaq, Shadrach, and Abednego. But what he didn't know is that God has done the same for Fannie Lou Hamer and Ann L. Ponder. Ponder. She uses the story of those who survived fire because of the presence of Jesus in the text to remind them that she is not, she knows that she is asking them to step into difficulty, but what does faith look like? She's also reminding them that she and others are already doing the work. And if this is the faith that we say that we have, what are we then doing? Equally, if not more centered was her personal narrative as the primary text in her proclamation. See, her story became the fodder that she used to show the necessity for the change she caused. Hamer knew that her story was significant to her message. Memory loss is a practice of supremacy. So she told her story as a practice of remembering. And she didn't just tell her story, she told it explicitly with the details that were probably hard for her to remember, with the details that would make people squirm in their seats. And the reason she said is, I'm not here for comfort, but for change. And what she knew is that if she made her story palatable, then folks could say it wasn't that bad. As she says, if it's not the truth, it ain't God. Hamer uses storytelling as a rhetorical tool to shape new narratives of the text and tell critical narratives of her life it wasn't just the story of I am still here, it was also a critique of why did this ever happen? And an assertion that these conditions were dissonant to the God that folks inflicting harm claimed they loved and followed. As a third thread of thunder, I will lift is rhetorical exigency as the call to preach. Exigency is defined as an urgent need or demand. In his article, The Rhetorical Situation, Lloyd Bitzer argues, quote, an exigency which cannot be modified is not rhetorical. Thus, whatever comes by necessity and cannot be changed are exigencies, but they're not rhetorical. So what am I saying? Hamer had a rhetorical situation because she knew that the conditions that were, she was preaching against actually could be changed. They didn't just have to be. So I wonder then who the urgent demands of the situation called for a response. And so I wonder then who has the luxury of call without exigency? Not black women, and certainly not Fannie Lou Hamer. See, instead of what are you called to as a preface for understanding vocation, and in this case, the places where folks might preach, I wondered how preaching would shift if the question became, what are you responding to? How might rhetoric shift if we truly believed it could mediate change and as preachers were explicit in their intended goal because the stakes were far too high to be vague, far too urgent to sit on fences. In the presence of exigency, practice also becomes critical to proclamation. See, while Hamer was talking about the necessity of voter equality and overturning voter suppression laws, she was creating space and trainings for black people to learn how to vote and what to do and how to resist together. 
While she talked frequently about the need for representation, she created the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to give voice to all the black poor folks who were otherwise not represented. While Hamer preached on the theological significance of mutual aid and what it meant to be a community where folks were not harmed under the harrowing head of poverty, she also created the Freedom Farm Cooperative. With the money, she was able to purchase 40 acres to attempt to give black folks land to own and an opportunity to get from under the white landowners their parent, their families had historically sharecropped for. See, when exigency is primary, the focus is on being effective, not great. It is not for the sound bite, the rhetorical gymnastics, or the pat on the bat after the proclaiming moment. When exigency is primary, the risk is also present because any time you are fighting the powers that be, history tells us that the goal of the powers is to suppress those voices fighting by any means necessary. Hamer shows us the good and the hard that can happen when exigency is primary and asks those of us who say we are called to preach to consider the exigent needs that we are responding to. I consistently learn so much from Fannie Lou Hamer's proclamation. For us to move forward beyond the rhetorical gymnastics, beyond the fame, beyond the flyers and the culture of preaching into proclaimers who do the work to ignite change, there are some questions we can ask that emerge from her preaching. One, what aesthetic must I disrupt? Two, what are the stories that are sacred and where do I position God in the story? Do I have a God that sits on the fence or a God that stands for justice? Three, if I never said another word, would my practice reflect anything but my rhetoric, about my rhetoric? And finally, what am I responding to in this world? What change am I hoping to participate in? Will I respond to lightning or from the safety of my shelter of privilege? Will I keep listening to these daughters of thunder? I've highlighted one woman today, but I could spend years learning from the rhetorical threads of black women who dare to thunder amidst the danger of lightning. I could never name them all, but I must name a few. Daughters already implies lineage. So I'm grateful though for those beloved preaching ancestors like Elizabeth, whose last name we don't know, Jarena Lee, Ida B. Wells, Sojourner Truth, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Mary McLeod Bethune, Polly Murray, and Maria Stewart. I'm grateful for the women whose life birthed me, Cassandra and Jean and Helen, Janie, Inez, Dorothy, and Jeanette. For the myriad of black women that I call mentor and friend and whose work is breaking forth new practices and expanding us into new worlds. And some of them that have been so critical to my life are right here on this campus. Dr. Shonda Jones, Reverend Brittany Hunt, Dr. K. Monet Rice Jallo, and Dr. Melva Sampson. Thunder, black women who disrupt normative aesthetics, who tell their story when folks say it's superfluous, whose practice to address critical needs is aligned in their proclamation, and I know you probably have some names too. So I'll end this portion and I look forward to the conversation with this final word, being thunder is not easy. It is tiring, it is exhausting, and it cannot be constant or it will be the very demise of those who pick up the practice. And so I'm reminded of what one of my best friends, Nikki, often says, quote, God will do what we can't do, but God won't do what we won't do. And so my question to each of us today, in the world of so much clear, dangerous, and horrific lightning, who here will have the courage to not simply seek the shelter of privilege, but amidst the storm, still choose to thunder? Thank you. Hey, Siri. Siri so nosy. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's give another hand. Mm. 
Chelsea, you provided so much for us to, we want you to use this too. Mm -hmm. um, you provided so much for us to consider and um, I want to pause and Chris, get ready for the end because we're going to still, uh, um, let's talk about courage mm. and let's talk about the cost. Let's talk about um, in this, in these, uh, in more than one crisis, these multiple crises, um, what is the cost of having courage as a black woman preaching in this age? It feels like everything. And I, I don't say that lightly. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Pinterest girl, so I love to, I love to swipe and see the quotes. Um, and one of the constant quotes is like, courage is not not doing, it's doing it scared. And it's like, yeah, of course, like, cool, thank you. But no one talks about the implications of fear on the body. To constantly be in an adrenalized state, hope my therapist friends are proud that are on the streaming, because <laughs> I think about this. But to constantly be in an adrenalized state is actually a dis-ease to the body. And so those that are under constant trauma, those that have to constantly go against their normative system and do things scared, we put our bodies in a vulnerable position. I don't think it was a mistake that after I defended my dissertation, which was different, which pushed against certain things, and also took everything out of me for a lot of reasons, that I was extremely sick. Because my body was like, oh, we get to rest now? And rest actually just looked like ailment. And so I think that Courage sounds cute until it has to be your constant state of being in a, a posture of on guard because courage says, I know that there's danger and I'm gonna do it otherwise. What does it mean for us to constantly have to run into danger? Talk to us. <laughs> These are my own practices I have to engage so I can stay on task. <laughs> Talk to us, let's talk about memory loss. Uh, one of the things you said was that memory loss, um, you said is a practice of supremacy, and, and I also add is a result of supremacy, uh, and the ways in which we have to uh, work to regain um, our imagination that many uh, that preaching in the age of crisis because there are so many crises that there is a way in which uh, we give up our imagination mm -hmm. because those who do this work give up imagination because um, we feel possibly guilt for um, not addressing each and every crisis so Right, so um, how, how, what, certainly we learn from Fannie Lou Hamer, but what might the Dr. Chelsea Brooks say um, as to how to retain imagination, one, and or two, what do you see? Let's do two first. What do you see needs to be reimagined in this practice? So there's a reason that I study historical women, because I actually think that we often think about imagination only looking forward to creating something that never was. And sometimes I feel like that's, of course that's necessary, right? It's a very artistic thing to see blank, a blank canvas and paint on it, right? But any artist will tell you that art is always relative. It's always referential. And oftentimes, particularly those of us in practical theology, which is my discipline, so I feel great to say this, um, skip historical data, his, skip the method for the seduction of the contemporary moment. And so I say that to say that a part of, for me, a practice of imagination, when it feels too hard and too scary to look forward and dream about what you know, could be, is to learn about the narratives and the dreams of those that have already come forth. Um, there are some things that I read in Hamer's letters, um, now I'm gonna get, you know, I'm gonna get full, that I realize I've lived into. Oh. Um, so I'm not the person that, you know, I don't think our ancestors dreamed of constant oppression and the chaos that is today, but I do think that somewhere in the ecosystem of her imagination, 
perhaps there was someone that would be like, y'all, let's do the work. <laughs> there would be someone that would pick up the things that she said. And so I think a practice of imagination is not just going forward, but also being clear and looking back. And so what I think that we have to change in our practices of preaching is that the prophetic is not just about yelling. And it's also not prophetic to say things to liberal spaces that they already know. We love to list the ills, and then this happened, and then this happened, and blah, 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 and without any invitation to practice. So imagine having awareness, but no response. And so I think that preaching as a practice has to prioritize exigency, has to prioritize practice, and then if needed, to use words. And so I would challenge myself and I challenge those of us that are teaching preaching, you know, and those of us that are writing about preaching, like, don't get me wrong, Dr. King's great, but we don't necessarily need another Dr. King book. And that's not me being, y'all Y'all got real silent. I'm not being hard. <laughs> I'm not being hard. Hallelujah. <laughs> but there's so many folks to think about and study, so many things happening in the contemporary moment. And so what I tell preachers to do is stop just looking at preachers in pulpits to get imagination. Go look at some poets. Go have some friends that are not pastors. Like, go do something else. Sit in coffee shops. Learn people. Engage. Organize something. Do something other than try to get your name and your face on another flyer because we are dying as a result of preacher fame culture. That's a clap. <laughs> So Chelsea, let's 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 go somewhere deep because you and I can. It's not deep for us, but let's let's just go somewhere and let's do a little. I'm ask you these questions back. Right. So let, let's just let's, let's just have a little riff. Um, so this semester, I'm teaching a course called Womanist Proclamation. I'm also teaching uh, Intro to Preaching, and in my Intro to Preaching course, um, one of our phenomenal students. Uh, all of them are phenomenal, but one particular student. Her name is Georgia McKee. <laughs> I didn't ask her. This is a little unethical, but um, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good one. She preached a sermon. Uh, I think, was it a Deuteronomy text, Georgia? I forget what, I think it was Deuteronomy, where she placed uh, Octavia Butler as God. Girl, it was good. Um, and so I want to talk, so that was sort of one for me looking and listening to Georgia, um, listening, uh, wave your hand, Georgia, so that Chelsea could see who you are, okay, right? That was a great idea. Right, so, because I need you to see who she is, so when you get, when I get to this next part of the question. So um, I was amazed um, and moved, but it also made me think about questions that have come up in my other course, in the Women's Proclamation course around what white women's roles mm -hmm. or white folks' roles are to stand alongside if there is a role or a place or a seat at a table, or do they get their own tables? Uh, what is, it, as one preaches in crisis and preaches in crisis in a multicultural setting in a community where they learn preaching at a predominantly white institution, I'm not going to ask you what's a role, because I don't think that's a, a appropriate, um, but I'm, I'm going to ask you to riff a little bit on the ways that imagination matters, and when, when black women model that imagination, uh, the portal that it opens possibly for others. You know, you, were, you said tables, and I started to think about imagination. It made me wonder, maybe tables is also not what we should be creating, right? Maybe we need more living rooms. We need more places where people can sit and gather. There's something about a table that inherently has limits, right? You can only have a certain amount of people there. <laughs> and so I feel like sometimes we, we, we want to want liberation, but really we just want a seat at the table. And so that's a different, that's a different thing. <laughs> if you just want to see at the table, you just want to be in the position of power and then we just recreate those systems and it's chaos. Um, and so, a couple of things come to mind about those that are not black women for when, you know, we open these portals to imagination, to these ideas, is first of all, cite your sources. I think one of the things that is most egregious is when I hear 
uh, black feminist methodology and womanist methodology, or I hear quotes taken out of context from the Morrisons, the Butlers, uh, Hamers, and used as if it is a fresh word from white lips. And that is sh violent. And so reference without citation is perpetuating the same violence. And also, the risk that I take is not the same risk that white folks should be taking because I'm already sitting in a marginalized body, right? Like I'm already sitting on the margins. So any risk I take is just shoot me deeper off into the margins, right? Um, Whereas when you sit at the center, you should be pushing it more. You should be risking more. You should be costing more. And so I feel like one of the things that our allies is such a limiting word, comrades, let's go with that. Our comrades should consider is, am I willing to, 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 am I willing to bear a cost that actually means something? And if not, be quiet. And I mean that because I think if not, you get, the, you get the gift of the applause for sounding woke, but the luxury of still going to bed well. Chelsea, talk to us about um, uh, your time here at Wake Div, um, let, me, let me zone it in a little bit because that's kind of broad. But talk to me about your takeaways. Um, we heard earlier on the panel uh, about what the panelists felt they were prepared for mm -hmm. and or not. Um, what do you think theological education prepares black preaching women? How does it prepare black preaching women to preach in the age of crisis? Uh, and specifically, what do you think Wake Div did or did not do to assist in that? Um, so when I was here, the professor of preaching was Dr. Ronis Miles. Uh, Shout out to Dr. Love, Miles. <laughs> who I love, and I say this because, one, I think it's funny, and also it's facts for my friends and colleagues here who know this to be true. So I went to her before class started, you know, I had to, I wanted to take intro, and I was just like, I just wanna let you know I'm not a preacher. I don't do that thing that other people be doing. Um, and so I'm just letting you know I have to take this class. <laughs> But I am not really, I mean, imagine doing all of that, like, right? I don't <laughs> have so, to imagine. Yeah. I have students who say that. Yeah, so it's like, <clears> oh, <throat> I, don't, I don't do all of that. I'm just letting you know I just have to be here, whatever. And at some point, she was preaching in my first semester. And, you know, I went to go. We were all going. And for the first time, I heard something that sounded like something I might want to do. And it shook me. I was unwell. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Um, and so I say that to say one of the things that Wake Div gave me was mentors, um, and not just run, I mean, I could run the list of mentors, I'm not going to, because I know I'm gonna forget somebody, I hate that. But people who were like, I'm not asking you to do the thing like everybody else. I'm asking you to figure out how to do the thing like you. And beyond the classes, beyond the, you know, I took all the things, et cetera, and I kept going on to keep reading and whatever, studying, but I never, tried, I never was, I never thought I had to mimic somebody to get on a stage or a pulpit. I was always, I was like, oh, I was a, I was preaching when I was a spoken word artist. Oh, that makes sense. Like, it started to click, and so I feel very grateful for a space that gave me time to fall apart theologically, because baby, that happened. Lots of crying in Jill Crenshaw's office. <laughs> uh, because I really fell apart. I was like, who is God? What is God? Is, is God anything? Um, but what I will say that I think theological education is not doing that can do better, or maybe we're doing it in individual courses, is helping students that come in not think that they are a blank slate. We come in with wisdom, we come in with stories, you come in with experiences, and what happens is folks are posited into these pockets of evangelical and conservative and liberal and whatever that confines them in their own mind for the rest of their time as opposed to be like what is your story what is the what is the wisdom you've already brought into this space and then giving yourself place to expand it and I'll end here uh Kay Monet where is she at uh I went to her office and I was, uh, excuse me, Dr. <laughs> Rice Jallo. <laughs> I went to her office and I was uh, 
um, a mess at the end of my first year, and she said something that has stuck with me. She said, instead of only thinking that you were falling apart, imagine yourself seeing the pieces fall so that new ones could come in. You cannot expand with the same pieces. And so in the spirit of that, I wonder what it would look like for us to start there. You have pieces, and some of them are going to break off, and some people are going to. But some of those things, like some of them hymns that I can unpack theologically, are still my favorite hymns. <laughs> and I'm not going to give that up because someone has told me that they don't want to hear them. Like, no, the blood that Jesus shed for me is my <laughs> hymn. <laughs> I'm not going to stop praying to Father God, but I'm going to just expand to Mother God and Parent God and Creative God, because sometimes gender language actually just isn't helpful to the thing I'm trying to preach or speak about. And so it becomes a both and, and I think theological education could do a better job of helping people get to the both and instead of the either or. So certainly I can go on, um, but I want to have an opportunity to see if we have any questions either from the live stream or from our uh, participants who are here in Wake Chapel with us today, this evening. Okay, y'all don't have any? All right, so Chelsea. Uh, okay, um, you may have to come Roger, is there a mic for him, or can you? So I just asked my colleague, my sister Comrade, if I could share, if we could share in this um, talk back to give her a moment to kind of rest and breathe. Um, one of the strategies is to go back to memory. Here you see on this table are some names. This being the Daughters of Thunder, Daughters of Emma, Daughters of Lucy, Daughters of Anne, Daughters of Man uh, Nancy, Daughters of Emma, Daughters of Pompeii. These are a part of the 14, enslaved, one group of 14 enslaved people who were sold. And the benefit from that sale was to forward Wake Institute, which of course becomes Wake Forest University. So one strategy is to remember the literal cost, not the figurative cost but the literal sale of a body. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that sale, mm -hmm. second is it is important for us to develop and to curate what I would say, one of my guides always says, Dr. Itihari Ture, communities that are strong enough to hold your truth. Everyone is not a comrade. That's even risky for me to say on this stage. There's a cost to showing up to speaking truth to power. There's a senior colleague in here right now, right, right under this building, uh, under this roof who's here right now, who has paid major because of the way she has spoken truth to power. Because while the church may not have ever given her a license and no male authority may, have never, have, may not have ever ordained her, she certainly is a black preaching woman and has proclaimed nationally and internationally. The risk, however, is what happens when you risk yourself, your voice, your position, and there is not a community that is strong enough to hold the truth that you are proclaiming so that when pieces fall, sometimes you're left standing there holding them. And that's why we are 
I am, we are, I'm only interested in comrades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because allies don't have to really give up anything. No, they gain stuff. Yeah, you, you, you gain a lot. But I want to know, and Chelsea said we need living rooms, because I want to know what you're talking about in your living room. Mm -hmm. I want to know when, it, when, when the rubber meets the road and you hear something that's problematic, I want to know what your response is when you're not at the Board of Visitors. I want to know what's happening and how we're engaging. Mm -hmm. So those are two. One, that we are engaging in recovering our memory. Two, that we are developing uh, communities that are strong enough to hold our truth. And three, the risk is we gonna stop grinding because preaching in the age of crisis always has you in the grind. Right. And grind culture, we understand, shout out to the Nat Bishop, Trisha Hershey, and her work, Rest is Resistance. We understand that this grinding, because of our position, which has levels of intersections, social socioeconomic status, sexuality, class, race, gender, all of these layers that would suggest because if you present, in a, if, you don't, if you're not standing or living in a certain intersection, then there is a way in which if you want to eat, you got to grind. But that kind of capitalistic value that doesn't seep in, that walks right into the kind of work that we do, sto storms into the kind of work that we do, makes the risk even higher because we often know that if we take the risk, then we might not be here then other people have the opportunity to say when and where we enter. And Anna Julia Cooper already told us that they don't. Ashe. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Shalise. All right, so you, you reminded me, it's, you, you talked about kind of like reimagining structures, like maybe we, only, we don't need a table, maybe we need, um, a living room, and you also talked about uh, proclamation through through practice. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about kind of um, how how our faith communities might need to be differently structured, or expectations might need to be um, mediated in a sense in order to accomplish that. You know, I'm going to be honest. I'm going you know, I'm to I'm be courageous. We're sitting here. Come Why on, not? Girl. Let's have fun. I can hold your truth. <laughs> I appreciate I got it. You. We're in the living room. Let me, right. look, let me turn this way. Church right now, for me, is perplexing. This is why I want to say that. Not every church, because y'all mean, my church does this. Don't Please don't come to me after defending your church. It's not a place of apology. <laughs> But because of what I do, yes. I look at a lot of preaching-ish. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I be tired. Um, people send me a lot of sermons. What do you think about this, Doc? Um, and what I realize is people don't actually want to know what I think. Uh -uh. They want to know. It almost feels like a lure to say what I'm about to say now. So for all the people that's been sending me those that wanted to know this, here we go. I think that church as is in this structure, particularly where Sunday worship is the primary locus of community, where one preacher is the primary mediator of God's sacred speech, has lost sight of what it actually means to follow someone, AKA perhaps the homie Jesus, and what I mean by that is we are in a follow culture. You follow people on Instagram, you follow people, and we think like following is very easy right now. It's like, cool, I follow you and then I, you know, maybe I'll see you on the street, on the, <laughs> maybe I won't. But to actually follow someone means to move in such a way that where they step, we step. And if we're honest, a lot of our churches are built off doctrines of Paul not gospels of Jesus. <laughs> doctrines, excuse me, see this well. I got real preachy, so I started to rhyme. Um, <laughs> doctrines of Paul and not the gospel of Jesus. And so for me in our faith spaces, 
I think it sounds almost so clinical, but some of us need to go back to bylaws. Some of us need to go back to what are we building church space on? Some of us need to ask what are we doing and why? And tolerance is not a form of love. Period. And being like, oh, I'm, I'm open enough to not hate you, but affirming, not affirming enough to, you know, offer marriage equality or whatever is not a space where you should invite people into. And so I think that some of our churches need to be honest about that they are actually the locus of violence. They are the, they are the lightning. <laughs> they are the place. And until we can reckon with that, until we can repent by way of new, something new, we're going to be stuck. And so what are some practices then? You know, if, we're, if there's going to be a critique, there should be an invitation. I think some practices are conversations of, like, of leadership with other people. Actually being in relationship with people who are not also pastors. And I keep saying that. And folks be like, oh, that's, that's a soft skill. It's not. Because there are some people who can call me out because they're in another space. They're like, why would you say that from the pulpit? That's silly. True. It is silly. <laughs> it, why would I make a metaphor of someone's actual lived reality? Mm. That's silly. And so actually being in a relationship, but two, thinking about what are, what are the accident, actual exigencies and why do people gather? We're in an epidemic of loneliness right now. It's very true. It's not cute. It's very real. Quarantine exacerbated it and has continued on, but it's been going for a while because of individualism, of movement, of where people have to go to survive, all of that. So what would it look like for churches to have spaces where you're not trying to proselytize, but where people can kick it? Where you feed people, not baby wafers, but like a meal, a balanced meal with vegan options, that's me. And so I just think we have to really ask ourselves, instead of looking at the critiques of Paul, to look at the verbs of Jesus to gather, to heal, to walk with, to journey with, to sit with, and to consider how will we move differently if that's where we started. Chelsea, thank you so much. We can go on and on and on, um, but unfortunately we have to come to a close um, as Chris prepares to take us out. You could go ahead and start playing right on under my voice. Come on, give me, go on and just give us right into that tradition. Yeah, God said day. <laughs> um, what would you say? Go ahead, keep, keep, keep going. I'm not going to sing, but keep, keep going. <laughs> As we, I want us to think about, all, all of us to think about this. Dr. Daniel Black once said, uh, it is really an, uh, folks who don't really think far into advance to think that black girls won't become black women who will inherit what black women were unable to work out fully. And so I see my own daughters, Free and Phoenix, are out here somewhere. For the black preaching women who are on the way, for who are, whom are developing, what are your words to them from a position of an auntie? <laughs> what would you say? Who is waiting for them? What are you telling them to move around with? How are you telling them to handle the crisis? How are you telling them to care for themselves? What will you say to them when someone says, like Reverend Hood Scott says earlier, that there is no call there. What are your words to the generation on its way? Mm. What I really wanna say is care for yourself relentlessly. And a part of caring for yourself is knowing yourself outside of the constant gazes of those who would try to limit you into baby boxes. And so I think that one of the things that perhaps hopefully we've done, we can do, is teach what comrades are earlier so that our girls that will become black women are not as vulnerable to the seduction of affinity at the cost of their true belonging. Um, 
And then my other thing that I would say is to fortify yourself. This world is hard. I'm exhausted in real life right now. To fortify yourself with practices that connect you to the expansive nature of God, as opposed to feeling the need to mimic what people have decided is holy. Because if truth be told, it wasn't the text that saved me during quarantine. It was the decks. It was tarot cards. It was Reiki. And so if God can speak through a donkey, God can speak through a deck. And so for our girls to actually have space to imagine the possibilities, um, to call us into accountability, to be comrades to them and to learn from them and to change some of our ways because some of the things we can't even see because of the harm that we've endured. Friends, help me. living in vain, child. You better play that. Let us once again thank Dr. Chelsea Brooks Yarborough and the Reverend Dr. Melva Sampson. We also want to thank our earlier panelists, the Reverend Raquel Gill, the Reverend Dr. Kia Scott, Kia Hood Scott, the Reverend Love Lemon, the Reverend Dr. Michelle Meggs, and of course, the Reverend Dr. K. Monace Rice Jala. This has truly been a historic gathering for the McBrien Prophetic Preaching Series. We've had many gatherings under this series, but none like this. And this is only the beginning of this truly a renewed series that's going to really focus in on the prophetic and what better way to start than the prophetic voice of black women. We want to continue the conversation and we invite you to join us for a reception that's right in the North X of Waite Chapel. So please join us for that reception as we conclude this year's uh, 2023 McBrien Prophetic Preaching Series but we also want you to understand that the conversation does not end tonight. There's only a moment of pause, but we must begin to operationalize and embody a hammer hermeneutic as we go forth and continue the days of our lives. Thank you and God bless you and please join us for a reception. <laughs>